Good morning, everyone. Wasn't that a beautiful set, a uh, couple of renditions by the Oakwood University Aeolians? If you appreciated it, would you put your hands together one more time? There's no place like Oakwood for worship, and we're grateful to be here this morning. And I'm especially grateful to each of our administrators for their contribution to this morning's program. I uh, wish to bring you just a few quick announcements about great things that are happening at Oakwood and then to immediately go right into the preaching of the Word of God. Um, this week, you know we are doing registration, amen? Doing registration, and uh, God is still in the giving business. Can you say amen to that? He is. Uh, we received notification from one of our banks that through a computational error, uh, we were due a $150,000 rebate. Amen. This week, we took that $150,000, and rather than bury it in further operations, we donated that money to helping students clear. And so at this moment, we have 1,584 students who are cleared, but another 125 or so, approximately 120, it's hard to nail the numbers down, they move. Uh, so I took the mid number, 125 students who are yet to clear. And uh, we want to keep them in prayer. The institution is doing all that it can to help them to get across that line because a mind is a terrible thing to waste. And we want these young people to be able to succeed. And would you help us with that? I want to make an appeal. That's okay, I can, I can work with this. I'll just stay with this. Um, I don't want to make an appeal. The last time we talked about this, for anyone who may be watching, the last time we talked about this, we had a couple come to my office and say, Dr. Pollard, we really would like to help students succeed. And they brought a check for $10,000. <laughs> Any of you today who would wish to do so or do similarly, please feel free to do that. And we will certainly use those funds to help students realize their dreams. We say that Oakwood University, we're one big midwife. Our job is to help students give birth to their dreams. So that's what we're actually doing. Um, let me just update you on just two other two things. As you know, uh, and per the Oakwood Magazine, uh, you're welcome to pick up a copy from Mr. George Johnson in Public Relations and Integrated Marketing. Uh, but there's a story here about the first Edible Arrangements franchise that we purchased and closed on. Since then, ladies and gentlemen, we have purchased our second, and we closed on it on December 31, 2014. This means... What this means then is that we are diversifying our industry base and creating revenue that can help us not only suppress, but decrease the cost of attending Oakwood University. That's a big dream, but that's what we've got to do. We want the numbers to go in the other direction. And so when you think about your gifting options, remember Oakwood University and Edible Arrangements, we now own both stores. We own the store on Whitesburg Drive, and we own the store on University Drive. And when you prepare to do your gifting, the place for you to think about, I want two words to come to mind. Edible arrangements. Come on, say amen. Okay, you don't sound excited. But uh, I'm excited, so thank you very much. Uh, third announcement, similarly, uh, Healthy Campus 2020, you will hear more about this. This is a proposal that was written, authored by Dr. Prudence Pollard, our inimitable first lady. Uh, and it, it's, a, it's a proposal designed to make Oakwood University the healthiest campus in America. That's the goal. You got it? We're going to use creation health principles. We will be partnering with Florida Hospital. And per the proposal, the request was given to Florida Hospital, and they responded to the request to the tune of $700,000. For that, we're very grateful. And one last item in the same direction as health and wellness. We've talked about a health and wellness center for years now, and now it's time to begin concretely moving forward with those plans. I had a meeting with the president and CEO of Adventist Health and made an appeal to him and a pitch to him to assist us because, again, Oakwood in the Southern Union and the North American Division, all of these things. Make a long story short, I made a certain request to him, and uh, that request was for $2 million. 
Uh, last week, I received notification that that request has been honored and that there is a check with Oakwood University's name on it for $2 million. Here is what I'm saying. God continues to give favor to Oakwood University. The big game changer, and Dean Knight mentioned it, Oakwood Online University. This past week, Dr. Murray Joyner came in, one of our alumni, and brought in Dr. Ronald Godwin, who is the author, founder of Liberty Online University. They started with a dream. Today, Liberty Online University has 98,000 students online. This holds great promise for LEAP. It holds great promise for Oakwood Online University. And I thought, I looked over to my right and I saw Dr. Murray. Would you just stand, please, sir? Of course, you know the family members, Elder and Mrs. Joyner. We love you. And Mrs., but please stand, please, please. Don't be shy, Doc. We appreciate your humility. Thank you. Thank you. He brought over Dr. Godwin, and he happens to be his physician. And, uh, and we're very excited about that. Those are my three minutes of announcements. Now let's get to the preaching of the word. Let's bow our heads. Dear Lord, we ask for your wisdom today as we present this message intended to exalt your cross and your Christ in Jesus' name. Amen. After his wife of 30 years died of a very rare form of cancer, a very wealthy man, Dr. Norman Johnson, as per the story, and his son, Albert, bonded around their love for collecting rare works of art. Their collection contained everything. Picasso, Monet, Raphael, Dali. And together, they would collect and admire these great works of art. The mother certainly would have been proud. Then, the Vietnam War broke out. Albert, the son, was drafted into war. Now, the soldiers in his battalion, they loved Albert because not only was he unaffected by his wealth, but he was also very courageous, and there was nothing that was beneath him. While in Vietnam one day, a firefight broke out during the famous Tet Offensive. One of his fellow soldiers fell to the ground screaming and wounded. Without hesitation, Private Albert Johnson rushed to the screaming, bleeding soldier, leaned over him, grabbed his face in his hands, looked deep into his eyes, and said, You will live. Albert immediately scooped him up, slung him across his shoulders, and began dashing back toward friendly lines when just before he reached safety, a bullet in the chest killed Albert and he died while rescuing another soldier. The father was notified. He grieved deeply for his only son. About a month later, just before Christmas, there was a knock at the door. A young man stood at the door dressed in a military uniform. uniform. He had a large package in his hand and he said, "Sir." You, you, don't, you don't know me, but I am the soldier for whom your son gave his life. He saved many lives that day, and as he was carrying me to safety, that was when the bullet struck him in the heart and he died instantly. Sir, he often talked about you and your love of art. And then the young man held out a package he said, sir, I, I know this isn't much, and I'm really not a great artist, but I think your son would have wanted you to have this. The father quickly opens the package. It's a portrait of his son, painted by this young soldier. He stares in awe. He stares in awe at the way the soldier has captured the personality of his son in the painting, especially the eyes. The father was so drawn to the eyes that his own eyes welled up with tears, and he thanked the young man and offered to pay him for the picture. Oh, no, sir, I could never repay your son for what he did for me. It, it's, it's a gift. The father gingerly received the picture, 
clutched it to his chest, and then hung it over his mantle so that every time visitors came to his home, he would take them to see the portrait of his son before he would show them any of the other great works he had collected. A few months later, his father died. And some say it was from a broken heart. And at his standing room only funeral, it was announced there's going to be an auction of Dr. Johnson's pictures, his paintings. Auction day arrives. Many influential people gather, excited over seeing the paintings and having the opportunity to purchase one for their collection. On the platform sits the painting of his son. The auctioneer pounds his gavel. The Johnson Estate Auction is now open for bids. We will open the auction with the bidding, and we will begin with the picture of young Albert Johnson, the son of Dr. Johnson. Who will bid for this picture? Silence muffles the room. These connoisseurs of fine art grumble with impatience. Then a voice in the back of the room shouts, Sir, we want to see the famous painting. Skip this one. But the auctioneer persists, persists. Will someone bid for this painting? Who will start the bidding? $100, $200. Another voice shouted angrily, We didn't come to see this painting. We came for the Van Goghs, the Rembrandts. Get on with the real bids. But still, the auctioneer continues, The sun, the sun. Who will take the sun? Finally, a thin voice, weary with the years, rises from the back of the room. It is the longtime gardener of Dr. Johnson and his son. He says, sir, I'll give $10 for the painting. Being a poor man, it was all he could afford. But the auctioneer had to accept the bid. We have 10. We have 10. Who will bid 20? Give him the picture for 10, snorted one of the experts. Let's bid for the masters. But the auctioneer continues, $10 is the bid. Won't someone bid 20? The crowd now becomes angry. They don't want the picture of the sun. They wanted the more worthy investments for their collection. The auctioneer pounds the gavel, going once, going twice, sold for ten dollars. Now a man sitting on the second row shouts, good, now let's get on with the collection. And the auctioneer does something mysterious. He lays down his gavel and he says, I'm sorry, the auction is over. What about the paintings? He said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. When I was called to conduct this auction, I was told of two stipulations in the will. The first stipulation is that the picture of the sun is auctioned first. That stipulation has been satisfied. But the second stipulation that I was not allowed to reveal until this time is that only the painting of the sun would be auctioned. And whoever bought that painting would inherit the entire estate, including all the paintings. The man who bought the sun gets everything. My message today is brief but pointed. Buy the sun and all else is free. Now, we love a sale, don't we? Thanksgiving Day sale and New Year's Day sale. We are a commercial culture, omnivorous when it comes to buying and to selling. There's Memorial Day and Cyber Monday. And sales psychology, we are told, is simple. The seller's job is to convince the shopper that the value of what is offered exceeds what you will pay for it. True. So, who goes to a New Year's Day sale or Black Friday or Cyber Monday and expects anything for free? None of us do. But I want to raise a question this morning to a community, a culture that is fascinated by sales. Has there ever been a sale to equal the sale of the century? 
Now, here's what I mean. 2,000 years ago, the greatest advertisement ever for the love of God was advertised on a cruel cross. His face, a bloody, disfigured pulp, as he peers out onto a world from swollen slits where eyes once stood. Through his parched tongue, he declares now that we have been redeemed and bought back to God. Hands extended in mercy, punctured by rusty iron nails, blood and water seeping from his lacerated side. Mount Calvary did not look like much of a sail that day. But the songwriter says, on a hill far away stood the old rugged cross, the emblem, the emblem, the emblem, let me update the language, the commercial, the advertisement, the broadcast of suffering and shame. On that cloud-swaddled mountain, the greatest transaction ever witnessed took place. Love in human form buys us back from death. Love buys us back from darkness. Love buys us back from destruction. Love buys us back from disease. Love buys us back from despair. Much like the auctioneer, the same message that he shouted was shouted from Calvary. The son, the son, who take the son? Now, I'm keenly aware that the notion of buying the Son may violate some of our theological notions of salvation. Since almost everywhere we read in Scripture, salvation comes as a gift. However, there are at least two stories in Scripture where commercial imagery describes the experience of salvation. And you heard both of them this morning. Jesus, the master teacher in Matthew 13, is now spinning out his parables of the kingdom. And he's trying to, as a master teacher, move from the known to the unknown or the less known. And so, as he is teaching in parables, Jesus, the founder of Christian education, now begins to tell another parable. He says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant, buyer and seller, seeking beautiful pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Hear me now. Unlike the rich young ruler who was told to sell all that he had but kept it, these buyers sell all that they have rather than keep it. Two shoppers, one probably poor, the man stumbling upon the field, the other probably rich, the merchant wholesaler, wholesaler. Now, with shrewd eyes for value, both of them begin to make a purchase and they lay out for us something about the transaction of salvation. Notice what happens. First, they find. Second, they sell. And third, they buy. So if you are looking for the sun, you've come to a good place here at Oakwood University because the sun is everywhere. Now, I will be the first to say, especially to new students who are with us, whatever you are looking for at Oakwood University, you can certainly find that. If you're looking for righteousness, you'll find that. But if you're looking for weed heads, you'll find that. If you're looking for young people who are focused, you'll find that. But if you're looking for the party crowd, you'll find that. You will find whatever you are looking for at Oakwood University. But here is the good news. If you're looking for Jesus, you'll surely find that. Because these grounds are still sacred. So, if you are shopping for the sun, let me first say that you will find what you are looking for. Here is the second thing. If you're shopping for the sun, 
You've got to do like these two men. You've got to plan to sell everything that blocks your purchase. Notice, both men in the parable sell first. Now, Mrs. Ellen White says, that pearl is Jesus. And she says this, sell everything and buy him. Now, here's what that means to me. That means that I need to put a sale, a for sale sign on whatever gets in the way of my relationship to Jesus. Yes, it does. So I need to put a for sale sign on foolish friends. That's what the Sabbath school lesson is about. The book of Proverbs is calling us to wisdom. Uh, put a for sale sign on self-serving plants. Put a for sale sign on self-importance. Put a for sale sign on self-centeredness. Put a for sale sign on worldly ambition. After you sell, buy him the pearl of great, Christ, great price. May I quote Christ's object lessons? Here it is. Christ's object lessons, page 118. We are to seek for the pearl of great price, but not in worldly marts or in worldly ways. The price we are required to pay, listen, 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 is not gold or silver, for this belongs to God. He asks you to give up your sins. Christ Object Lessons, page 118. Okay, what a sale. What, li listen now, what a sale. Give up the very thing that will kill you, that will hurt you, that will destroy you, that will disable you. Give up your lying. Give up your stealing. Give up your smoking. Give up your drinking. Give up your promiscuity. Give up your unreal housewives. Give up those things that ultimately will destroy. I'm reminded of Jim Elliott, Jim Elliott, Jim Elliott, who said, he is no fool who gives away that which he cannot keep to gain that which he can never lose. <laughs> Sell that and then buy Jesus. Buy Jesus and you buy joy. Buy Jesus and you buy peace. Buy Jesus and you buy hope. Buy Jesus and you buy faith. Buy Jesus and you buy contentment. Young people, listen to me now. I'm ending. It is not necessary to have an opinion about Alexander the Great, young people. It is not necessary to have an opinion about Gandhi. It is not necessary to have an opinion about Karl Marx or Sigmund Freud or Florence Nightingale, or Oprah Winfrey, or Buddha, or Confucius, or Napoleon, or even Martin Luther King. But when confronted with Jesus Christ, every soul must face the question, what do you think of Christ? As the pearl of great price, he is the biological and genealogical seed of David. As the pearl of great price, he is the theological and psychological son of man. As the pearl of great, of great price, he is the sociological and ontological bread of life. As the pearl of great price, he is the noumenological and morphological destroyer of death. Jesus is infinitely valuable. Jesus is celestially importable. Jesus is uniquely affordable. What think ye of Christ, he's asking? Well, if you ask me, I say I think he's like Duracell. Nothing can outlast him. If you ask me, I think he's like American Express. I don't leave home without him. If you ask me, I think he's like GE. He brings good things to life. If you ask me, students who still need to be cleared, he's like FedEx because when your help absolutely, positively has to be there overnight, he's like FedEx. What think ye of Christ? He's like Coke. He's the real thing. What think ye of Christ? He's like Hallmark cards. He cares enough to send the very best. What think ye of Christ? He's like Tide. He gets the stains out that others leave behind. He's like Sears. He has everything. He's like Scotch tape. You can't see him, but you know he's there. He's like Delta. He's ready when you are. He's like Allstate. You're in good hands with him. He's like Maxwell House uh, decaf. He's good to the very last drop. 
He's like dial antiperspirant. Aren't you glad you have him? Don't you wish everybody did? He's like bounty. He is a quicker picker upper. He's like Wrigley's gum. He'll double your pleasure and he'll double your fun. Oh, I'm scared to say this one. He's like Budweiser. For all you do, this God's for you. He's like Alka-Seltzer. Plop, plop, fizz, fizz. Oh, what a relief he is. So buy him and all else is free. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Justification is free, Romans 3.24. Righteousness is free, Romans 5.12. Eternal life is free, Romans 3.23. The Holy Spirit is free, John 14.16. Wisdom is free. I said wisdom is free. I said wisdom is free. Now, I know we love quotations from Martin Luther King, and this is his weekend. Check this one out. People forget that he said this, too. I'm talking about wisdom, right? Watch this. Dr. King said in his Nobel Peace Prize speech of 1964, nothing in the world is more dangerous than sincere ignorance and conscientious stupidity. That's Martin Luther King. Now, that tells me that we don't have to be stupid. Come on, say amen, somebody. James 1, 5, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. Notice now, when you buy Jesus, all else is free. Peace is free. John 14, 27, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Purpose is free. So many young people, especially many of our young men, are looking for purpose. John, Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace, to give you an expected end. Purpose. The last time I talked to you, I told you that we would be intentional about planning activities for young people, uh, especially for young men. Well, now, here's one I want to announce in the wake of that. Our Champions Conference, um, sponsored by the Office of Spiritual Life, will take place on the weekend of February 20th, both here in Huntsville and in Louisville, Kentucky. And busloads of young men are going to be driving down, driving down to the Muhammad Ali Center in Louisville and talk about purpose and courage and what it means to be a man. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. See, see, you are a male by birth, but you're a man by choice. And we're emphasizing that. Guidance is free. Proverbs 3, 6. Coaching, watch this, coaching is free. Your ears will hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. Did you know that when you buy Jesus, protection comes free? Isaiah 59, 19, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. Help is free. Psalm 121, verse 2, shall I lift up mine eyes to the hills from whence comes my help? My help comes from the Lord. Power is free, John 1, 12. To as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. And finally, as a person who is in and out of airports all the time, I want to say that I'm so grateful that when I buy Jesus, one day even travel will be free. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain shall be what, everybody? Shall be caught up together. Travel is free. And even if I don't make it to his coming, I will wake up one day and realize that this Jesus was, in fact, a, a pre-purchased e-ticket to celestial travel. Come on, say amen, somebody. So guess what? If you buy the sun... All else is free. Every head is bowed. Every eye is closed. My question is the same question of the auctioneer. So who take the sun? Who will take the sun? I want to give you that opportunity today once again to commit at the beginning of 2015 to taking the sun because if you take the sun all else 
is free. And how do we do that? We let go of the very things that will destroy us, our sins. Our personal sins, our private sins, our quiet sins, our more public sins, whatever they are, we surrender that and we say to God, I trade it all in because now I'm buying the sun. And the package of benefits that comes with the sun, that package of benefits, you can claim them in faith. Is there someone here today who, having heard the Word of God, now is saying, God, by your grace, I'm ready. I'll take the Son. On Calvary, he didn't look like much. But you know something? The Bible says he's coming back. And the picture that no one wanted will now be the son in all of his grandeur and glory. And there will be a group who took the son and they will say, lo, this is our God. We've waited for him and he will save us. But there'll be another group and that group will say, hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne. I want to be in that first group, don't you? I want to be in that first group. So if you're standing today, you're saying, I'll take the son. I'll take the sun. Is anybody who want to stand and say, I'll take the sun at the beginning of 2015? I'll take the sun. May God bless you. I'll take the sun. I'll take the sun. I might not have much to give to the sun. That's okay. Whatever I have, he accepts. I'll take the sun. Dear Father, you see in this audience all of us who sitting at the auction of eternal life and eternal destiny are putting our bid in and we're saying we'll take the sun. So bless us and remind us every day that he that has the sun has life and he that has not the sun has not life. And we thank you and we praise you. Now, Father, there may be someone here who, in taking this first step, is also willing to take the second. May not be a member of the church, may not have made their decision for baptism, but today, after listening to the Word of God, after witnessing souls take their stand in the watery grave, now they are saying, I too need to be in the very next baptism. If there's someone today who in hearing the word of God saying, I'll take the son, and you're saying, God, whatever it takes, I want to be made ready to be baptized so that I can take my public stance for you and let the world know that I take the son. If that's you, would you just raise your hand wherever you are? Just raise it wherever you are. Wherever you are, just raise your hand. You're saying, I'll take the son, and I'll follow him all the way down into the waters of baptism. I'll take him. Is there some such person today? Would you come and offer a special prayer of consecration? And may you be blessed, ladies and gentlemen. And remember, if you buy the Son, everything else is free. Father in heaven, today, Lord, we buy Jesus. To others, we'll say, gain the world. But today, we say, give me Jesus. We thank you for using your manservant today, Dr. Leslie Pollard word today that we can apply to our lives we choose Jesus your word says that we seek you first your righteousness and all these things will be added to us the, your word says if the son sets you free you shall be free indeed today we buy Jesus we choose Jesus because Jesus is our everything the good news Lord we love today is the fact that while we buy Jesus the fact is the price has already been paid 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ died for our sins, and through his blood, today we have freedom, we have emancipation, we have everlasting life. So seal our commitments as we stand today and say we want Jesus. Thank you for Dr. Potter. Thank you for his team. 
the faculty, the staff, the students of Oakwood, the members of this church, the visitors from this community. Like a mighty army, God, we move your church forward. We thank you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Let everyone say amen. Can we praise God today for what God has done?